this event today is all about startups, obviously. But we can only succeed in the uh, energy transition if we have joint efforts. The big ones and the small ones. And obviously, E.ON, as uh, being the biggest here in Germany and uh, also one of the biggest in Europe, um, has a huge impact with whatever they do. And uh, I'm really excited to hear now from the CEO, uh, Dr. Johannes Tyson, um, on how he sees uh, the German Energiewende. So, <laughs> as you might uh, recognize, we Germans, uh, we are not so, uh, maybe not so funny, but we are very good in creating facts. We say we just do that now, and somehow we'll get there. But the question now is, um, uh, is that uh, an, a goal which is uh, maybe a bit uh, too ambitious, so it's really hard for reality to keep up with it? Or is it a goal which we exactly need in that kind of scope in order to push us all and the envelope uh, in this development further? So with that, I'd uh, like you to join me in welcoming uh, yeah, Dr. Tyson to the stage discussing um, the German energy transition backdrop or raw metal. This is your applause. Thanks. Hey. Well, maybe we start with German humor. Um, I don't know how many of you know the three shortest book of mankind. It's British cooking, <laughs> Italian naval war heroes, and German humor. Um, but we give our best. Um, so thanks. Um, for inviting me. Thanks for, to Christoph. Uh, I worked with you in the back for quite some time. And thanks to Andreas um, for giving the stage. Um, obviously, I'm well aware that I now, you know, I understand you are highly excited to listen to me. I work under the assumption that a significant number of the people are more having different prejudices, uh, old school, big utility. So um, let's see where the level of excitement and prejudice uh, stands in the end. Um, so I, you know, I want to start and set the stage on a bit, you know, obviously not matching your detailed knowledge on technology, but rather come from from a broader level and say, you know, is the energy transition that German is is that Germany stands for? Uh, will that be seen as a failed and unfortunate experiment or a template for the world? And believe me, both stories are being told in the world and at home, and both stories are deeply believed in. I would only say maybe it's um, a bit too early to do the call, because um, in the end should be judged well um, at the end, uh, and not in the beginning and not yet in the middle of a story. And I believe we are rather somewhere on the way there. Um, now, what makes a good story? What, what, what tells you if a story is good? I decided, you know, why don't you follow the advice of a good movie director, Billy Wilder? He said there are four rules to judge a good story. The first is, always remember your audience is fickle. Grab them by the throat and keep them all through. Second, develop a clean line of action and know always where you're going. Third, turning points in a story are crucial. Don't miss them and make them subtle and elegant. And lastly, the final act must build, build, build in tempo and action until the showdown. If I assess what we've experienced the last 20 years in Germany with the German energy translation, I would say the story shows some dramatic weaknesses but also some promising possibilities. And as I said, it's still in the middle of the story. So as Billy said, don't forget your audience is always fickle. Is it here? I would say yes. If I look again to our story from outside, from the world, and I just took part last week in Washington DC in the World Electricity Summit, all people admire the boldness of the German energy trans um, yeah, transition, yet they also see the huge costs and very limited results as far as CO2 efficiency is being concerned. And I would say many consider it in the world as another example of the romantic, quixotic side of the German character. 
Here in Germany, the audience, the German citizens at sit and stage, have indeed also proved to be very fickle. The prevailing mode shifts quite frequently. I remember times where people were celebrating the energy transition as an already concluded success and looked on the backward and hydrocarbon dependent rest of the world and um, how they would suffer. If I now look at the latest media since in the last half year and also listen to a lot of people in Germany, almost the same media now almost celebrate the story already as a proven expensive failure and point to all the shortfalls in the story and how unlikely it is to make ends meet. These shifts in public perception are accompanied by a visible diminishing support for the energy transition if you become more local with your questions. Surveys indicate that there's an overwhelming support to a general policy. However, when it comes to implementation in the form of new infrastructure, be it a wind park, be it a power line, be it some technology deployed with some risks of privacy failures, well, then suddenly all that support just diminishes faster than ice in the sunshine. So is that now a matter of poor communication? Have the German citizens been inadequately prepared for the energy transition? Or does the big story no longer capture the audience's imagination? And has the big story been lost behind a number of subplots whilst the central plot is more and more invisible. And there comes Billy Wilder's second advice, always keep a clean line of action and know where you are going. The original objective, the big story of the energy transition was to protect the Earth climate and to deliver an energy supply both sustainable and affordable without endangering prosperity, jobs and social inclusiveness for our country and the world. As this energy transition, however, moved forward, this leitmotif got lost behind more detailed, narrow interests. I named just a few. First, we got the promise of a strong German renewable industry, which will bring hundreds of thousands of sustainable, self-sustainable jobs and sustainable economic growth. Well, a few failures. The German solar industry is just gone. Although we paid for the development of solar in the world, there is hardly a sustainable company left. And the jobs were gone too. Second, regional implementation policies in Germany, of the states of Germany. You know, we have a federal system like the US has 50 federal states, like the provinces of Canada. Well, they deviate in such ways that you can't integrate them any longer. Some federal states in the north are building wind parks, is, is there another tomorrow? Much more than they can use in even the most optimal case and much more than they can even transport away and stop thinking about what to do with it. And those states in the center of Germany that were supposed to transport the surplus from the north to the south where the industry sits or to the west well, they just decided they don't want to build any transition lines because being just a transition country doesn't smell so good. It doesn't feel so good. So they decided, you know, we don't want to have any of that and we just sit on the state line and watch it. And then when it comes down to, let's say, the south, where maybe the surplus of the north could be used, well, you found states that rather defend uh, their special interests of their farmers in specific biomass questions, um, try to find other income sources for local people instead of trying to be part of a national integrated answer. So, as often in Germany, it's much more about value and advantage distribution than about first delivering an integrated value that you later could share. A third thing, obviously, that the world saw, Germany tries to just not talk about, is um, that the nuclear phase-out, obviously, 
distracted from the overall policy that was behind it. Because obviously, you know, what did we do? We replaced CO2 free nuclear by CO2 free renewables, and we replaced CO2 uh, uh, free, not free, but lesser CO2 gas <laughs> by, by coal. Well, the total outcome is obviously um, not a great success when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they remain rather flat over many years, although we have invested hundreds of billions of money. And um, obviously with that result, um, uh, people just wonder. I'm not challenging the decision to phase out nuclear. It's just, you know, it has um, a side effect uh, that, you know, in the greater story of this other movie that we were supposed to watch, uh, didn't help so much. Then some people had an ideological purpose uh, of rather, you know, they for them, the energy transition was more of destructing uh, big utilities. I would say there was uh, some positive outcome on the story, but um, it is not an outcome that creates any value per se. And uh, some people are still in the wrong movie by continuing to deploy all their arts and efforts um, in a war of the past. And I think the main thing is that we got more and more lost, not in an energy transition, but in a power transition. And what people miss there is that electricity, in the end, is not only part potentially of the answer, it might be the decisive answer of the energy transition. And if you then only clean power and forget that you need to use a product, to decarbonize the rest of the economy, then suddenly the big picture is totally lost. And um, as another movie said, you're lost in translation. So I think, uh, yes, the broader picture got lost. And as Billy Wilder told us, if the big picture is lost, people don't fully understand what's going wrong. But they see something is wrong. They're sitting in the movie theater as you are, and do they see the different subplots and they can't add it up. And they're missing where to go to. If I now follow the latest German debates after our fall elections here, um, they don't make me feel more secure that we have entered in the next better stage, because again, special interest is being debated. Some special interest that a lot of people here in the room will feel is a good issue, phase out coal. I have no vested interest in the story whatsoever, but um, I would again say, it feels like the whole debates when they tried to set up a German government was how fast can we phase out coal? As if the phase out of German coal is a decisive element, and if you get that right, then the end of transition has delivered. I think, again, it's, it's a side plot. Interesting, somewhat helpful, it is not the decisive element. And again, Germany got lost and forgot to debate the broader issues at large. Today, we need to finally set the stage in this movie to get a wave of innovation and investments that really create a climate-friendly, efficient and intelligent energy system. And unleashing those, the decisive element that I'm missing at home and abroad is there's one single policy thing that could set the stage right and point things in the right direction that is a sustainable, effective carbon price signal inside the European trading scene and outside of it. If greenhouse gases have a price, then everything turns by itself in the right direction. And then, if we were to have it, then you don't need to debate a coal phase-out commission. It's totally superfluous. Market and price will do it by itself. And you could, you know, it, it's an easy plot. You could see, have seen it in England. England created a national carbon floor price, and you could automatically see how coal phased down. And uh, again, if you get lost in detail, if you get lost in subplots, you pay a lot of money on a special interest story, and you again get lost in what the big story is all about. I believe, as Billy Wilder said, turning points are crucial. And the energy transition globally and hopefully at Germany should be seen at a turning point. What has begun as a more politically driven top-down project is now and needs to become an innovation and customer-driven bottom-up process. Shock 
therapy for the electricity system needs to become a true transformation of the entire energy transition. Two actors can decide where we go. It's technologi technological, that's a difficult English word for me, progress, every time I stumble on that, and um, customer needs. And together, technology and customer will decide what happens next. Politics can set the frame to expedite that, or stop that, or break it down, but they cannot fundamentally change it. What are the main takeaways that will shape the future of the energy transition here at home and abroad? And will then also decide if the German energy transition, backward looking, will be identified as a failure or a platform uh, for the world? My first belief is, thanks to its high efficiency, electricity, power, will be the oil of the 21st century. Oil was the energy in the 19th and 20th century. Power will be the very energy that makes a difference in the 21st century. This, for me, as an executive that works in this industry since 30 years, is totally exciting. I was bought part of an industry that was identified as being predominantly boring, stagnating or declining. I believe I'm sitting in the center of, an, of, of a business that is absolutely sexy, that will grow and that will shape the planet if you're sitting on the right side of the equation. Many studies predict that from now 30% electricity is part of the energy applications, power will grow from 30 to 50% and all other forms of energy will more or less decline. Isn't that great if you work in the industry? Not so bad. Second, yes, I truly believe that on the production side, it will be all about renewables, or mostly be about renewables. I'm always a little shy if I hear people say the word all. Uh, all you need to be an ideologist or believe in some religion Otherwise, my experience in the world is there's always some shady points, and that's not also not so dramatically difficult. Renewable power, wind, solar, and others, together with storage, will follow a declining cost line. It's shown by all the bits uh, of auctions now in the renewable world. It's also shown if you follow the trajectory of the declining costs of storage, it is absolutely amazing following this trend line and seeing where it could and most likely will go to. Thirdly, as I said, the pace setter will be finally the end customer. It used to be in, the, in our industry, it used to be politics or the big utilities, integrated companies, now it's the final customer. These people, they will decide in making the improvements for their homes, for their businesses, and for their communities. And since the major decisions will be taken at home, in your facilities, and in your communities, we will ob observe a total shift of decision-making from central stage to local stage, which tells you Never, never ever forget the customer. If I listen to investors in my industry, and obviously I'm regularly on roadshows talking to the in, uh, investors in the world, it is a, often a disgrace. People, they always ask me, who wants customers in this industry? Ah, look at England, it's so difficult, it gets regulated. It's, you know, everything, you know, it gets so detailed. Who wants customers? I said, you're totally missing the picture. This would be the one and only industry where customers don't matter. In every other industry, people strive with all they have to control and set the customer equation. Just in this industry, it should be different. I don't believe so. So I believe you need to be radically on the side of the customers if you want to profit from this more electric, more renewable world. Fourthly, what people sometimes miss is this will be the age 
of also the grid businesses. And I will, you know, it was what, what I'm standing for is what's traditionally been called the distribution system operators. Even the word is a total failure. It's total bullshit. It's still the term of the old world where you had central nuclear coal and whatever power station, transmission lines and then distribution lines. So central produced electrons were following and distributed to the final home. This, I think, will not be a grid. It will be a network. And this network, this local network, will be the very enabler of this more electric, more renewable, more integrated, more customer-driven society of tomorrow. So being involved on those networks gives you all the access to the very kind of technologies, customers, and equations where you can make the difference. So I think a lot of telecoms at some point also missed it. They want to be just mobile. Totally wrong. Look on how the tech companies, the big tech companies, look on networks. They're all about networks. And in our case, it's only possible also with physical networks. So being in those physical networks and developing them to the centerpiece of energy transition will be the decisive difference in winning or losing. And the fifth and last point that will shape the future is what solutions to deploy on those platforms. And that obviously is all about technology, digital, and all the likes and all the applications that a lot of new startups develop. If they enable, this is what I call this driver of the transition, the customer, if they create value, if they are workable on top of the platform, if they enable this green world, this electric world, then I think these solutions can be the decisive difference. And I just can tell you that we at Aon will support all kind of solution developments possibly. And if you bring those five mega points together in the Billy Wilder format and say, you know, this is my main story, and this I deploy, and this I just bring down to my audience, then I think we can overcome the shortfalls of the initial phase of the German policy-driven energy transition, which was just a partial power transition, and can make it the platform and the centerpiece of a global success. We and E.ON will, first and foremost, promote what we can do. We have an accelerator program, E.ON Agile. It's present here. We also came along with some startups that we support, and I just can invite you to come at 3.15, we have an E.ON Corporate Challenge Workshop. We would uh, welcome as many as possible from you. But um, besides these concrete actions of Accelerator, of strategic co-invest, all things that the big corporates do, which we obviously also do, I think um, I also, and this is again uh, challenging what I said about policy, this is detail. This is necessary detail. The big thing is also for corporate, what is your main story? Not what is your detail points. So the main story is we at Aeon, I think we stand for something that if the energy transition works, we believe it will work because we have given our hand, and secondly, we will be a profiteer of that if it works. We have taken dramatic strategic decisions to place ourselves at the very heart of what energy transition could be like. First, we spun off all conventional power businesses to a new subsidiary that is now being sold and uh, uh, traded, all gone. And now in a second step, we just did a major swap and acquired Energy, one of our main competitors, also a very great company. And what we do there is we divide the assets between the former owner, RWE, and us. We will stand as Europe's leading energy company for those questions that are closest to the customer. The customer solutions and the network businesses just around the customer. We will support and work with 50 million customers across Europe 
we will, you know, and I know that number doesn't matter much, but one and a half million kilometer of networks and connecting networks points across most of European nations we bring together. And yes, as a price for that, we had to part from the renewable businesses, but we know it will greatly develop at another place and nothing will stop the renewables. And it's just the utility size, the renewables that we don't build in the future, but we will connect them, we will enable them, we will bring them to the mobility end of the equation, to the heat and cooling end of the equation. We will make the renewables truly work. And therefore, it's not an end of the renewables for us, it's just a different delivery of the renewables where we're standing for. So as I said, also we at E.ON, we have also our own storyline that we follow. And I just can invite you to look at that and again, see what you do as startups, as venture capitalists. Also realign, always realign yourself to the major story and see if it really helps the big story or if it's just special interest sidekicks um, and just bring things home. And then as Bill D. Wilder said, would have said probably, say, then it's all about action. And then we'll see how the story unfolds. I'm certain the energy transition can deliver and my company and our partners can do a big difference there. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Tyson. May I ask you one question, Mr. Tyson? Thank you. So, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident you are um, that the energy transition is going to be successful? <laughs> is it a question of religion here? <laughs> no, I'm just... A religious question is 10, so I would... 8. Oh, that's because uh, pretty uh, I, I think there's always, until you deliver, there's always a also a chance that you can fail. I'm overwhelmingly convinced if you get things right, um, we have a very, very good chance to make it happen. Again, politics could play a, a role to bring it up to nine or so, and if politics does it wrongly, it can also, you know, stop the train a bit, and then it's more probably a six or something. So, I, I really like your story metaphor. Um, if we now project ourselves into the future, let's say 30 years from now, and we would look back to what is happening right now, what would be the plot that you would like to read um, out of this time in the energy transition? With this precise question, any, because 30 years from now, I'm almost 90. <laughs> <laughs> if I can read any story, I'm happy. <laughs> Which um, one would you like me to read you? Um, no, I would say... <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know if I still understand it, then, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> no, I, I would say if we really made it a true energy transition where green power has then powered mobility, and heat and cooling and integrated also in a local optimized way uh, driven by customers. You know, if, if those things come together and if, if customers then believe they profit from it, they drive the equation, they mm -hmm. can locally optimize it, they can really make a difference there. I think that's the stories I would love to read. Last or question. Or listen to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just uh, let me know. I'll be there. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, we'll be connected anyhow, somehow. Absolutely. So if you still can read. <laughs> if it's necessary. Probably only watch uh, much movies and uh, small clips. Correct, that's true. By Mr. Trump. Let's not replace the human <laughs> uh, element. So, so but um, uh, last question. Um, a lot has been said about blockchain technology, AI, and so on. Mm. And you also spoke about technology as being one of the key mm. drivers. Uh, how important do you consider, especially those two technologies, artificial intelligence and also blockchain, for your business? Admittedly, I, I would not claim I'm, I'm the best expert. So my, my, my gut feeling says technologies like blockchain, whether it is blockchain or something like blockchain, could be very decisive because they enable smart contracts. You know, it would be much too expensive to, to handle it in different forms. So something like that could be very decisive. Artificial intelligence um, will play a role. I'm not certain if it's not sometimes overhyped presently. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, there's tons of things that we need to square with, with artificial intelligence, um, you know, future, future of, of social inclusiveness and some other things admittedly also worry me. But uh, we use a lot of AI applications. They bring a lot of value. Um, but I think um, I'm still the optimist that also uh, old human intelligence could make a difference. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Tyson.